what I would like to do is I'd like to start with the international speakers and the international presenters. They've had a, a very limited exposure to high value nutrition prior to this. They're certainly the members of the International Science Advisory Panel have been um, made aware of the research strategy and have had the opportunity to comment both in terms of the priority research and have been made aware of the contestable round. But they certainly have never met many of you and they certainly haven't heard the research, nor have had they the opportunity to, uh, to participate actively in the discussion around where the science is going and what's happening. So what I'd like to do is start with the international speakers, the international presenters, and I'd like to get two things from them. One, what's their take out in terms of this conference, things that they've learnt. Uh, hopefully there's been some sort of cognitive engagement. So what's their take out? And two is, what's their thinking in terms of where we should go? What are, what are the, some of the great opportunities for high value nutrition here in New Zealand? Starting with you. Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Not you. you. <laughs> um, yes, what have I learned? Well, first of all, I've seen a lot of very interesting and exciting research going on. And this is research that is necessary. Um, it's not because the regulatory environment is so tough uh, in relation to claims that the science should stop. Uh, the science should continue and put the and, and, and provide the basis for further research. And even if research is not going to lead to a direct applicable claim for an individual product, the science is still going to be there uh, in order to ensure that you can communicate about the health benefits of certain foods and I think that that's something that uh, that I took away from these two days. So I think one of the takeaway messages for me in Bruce's presentation was the divorce that exists between food science and health and nutrition and that they need to be reunited and remarried and I think that's a pretty vital point here um, and in a way that will happen in the marketplace first. Uh, the other, the other thought I've got is, is still there's a huge opportunity around the use of digital technologies here for personalised food and nutrition and closing the gap between yourselves and that customer in Shanghai. Super. Mm. Mm. Bruce, the floor is yours. Well, actually, um, I, I have been uh, exposed to the program in New Zealand uh, before and, and I remain very excited by the potential of, of New Zealand to, to really be a world leader in the farm to fork concept um, that and, and and this two days very very much reinforced that that idea that I think you're on the right path if I had a suggestion uh, I, I would I would be bold um, I, I would I would decide what are the things that you could really lead the world in and and I mean it, you're the best rugby players in the world you're the best sailors in the world you could be the best at this Could you put that up on me? Uh, <laughs> your thoughts. But having said that, having said that, Bruce, what, is, what are some of the challenges and what's happening internationally? So my follow-up question for the international panelists is, who's our friends and who's our competitors? And in terms of building an international strategy, how and who should we be reaching out? And what would, she, what would she, we, what should we be aware of in terms of the changing international landscape? You. <laughs> um, yeah, I would. I would get rid of David Cameron. <laughs> that would be my first. <laughs> Don't worry. Taken care of. Tick. Next. Um, um, to be honest, I, I think you need to start thinking about who your customers are. Uh, I, I think you've had a very clear. Uh, analysis of, of the fact you don't have to feed 9 billion people. Um, you need to identify those people for whom uh, your products really will make a difference in their lives and, and go and get those. Uh, and, and that will require uh, recognizing who the real partners are in that uh, and, and it will minimize the amount of time you have to spend with people who aren't the best. But, but, but you have a bold idea then and get the best. So if I could follow up with you, Sean. So one of, the, one of the interesting features of science in Ireland has been subsequent to the banking collapse. There's been a real rethink in terms of the science strategy and the science system. 
And so in terms of New Zealand science, what are some of the learnings that we can take from Ireland? And what are some of the ways in which high value nutrition can demonstrate both domestically and internationally that it is the best? Dear, dear. <laughs> Thanks, David. Um, well, as far as Ireland is concerned, you know, the, the uh, problems were that the, there was a big um, decrease in spending, government spending, right across the board. People were taking hits of 25% in their salary, etc. But what the government did was they protected education, uh, especially protected research, which was a tremendous thing to do. Uh, so the Irish experience, I think, has been positive as far as research is concerned. Although I, I can uh, avail of that, but I'm also part of the UK, so th there's that aspect. I think from the, um, the Irish uh, experience, there's been a lot of um, these uh, knowledge transfer partnerships, which happens in the UK and Ireland, where young people go into industry uh, and they, are, uh, they work on problems with industry, but they have the university academic link. So there's a lot of money going in now in trying to get industry and academia working closely. And I think that's what you're doing here with High Value Nutrition. I'm similar to what Bruce said, uh, I've seen it evolve. Um, I've, I've, I've uh, looked at the early stages of what you've I've looked at the later stages, I've been very encouraged in what's happened uh, and particularly encouraged the way translational work has taken place uh, because you really need the translational and the human studies to, if you're going for uh, the uh, health claims, and I think that's a very important part of what you're doing. In some areas, of course, in the immune things, uh, is some way away from the translational, but um, there's nothing that can be done for that. Uh, the other aspects, uh, you noted, it was John coming in about the psychological aspects, and, the, and we know from Europe situation that there's a much greater interest in industry uh, and psychological uh, outcomes, and I suppose the aging population, especially in the cognitive uh, aspects. So. Um, I think what you're doing is extremely positive. Um, I, the, it's important, I think, for me to attend, and I think for all of the uh, advisory group to attend the meeting, because no matter what you read uh, through emails, etc., it's only when you meet the people. Uh, and I'm very encouraged by the the uh, way that people are getting on so well in the team. I know in Europe we spend a lot of money getting people together uh, and then the research happens. Here you've got a smaller country, you're getting people together, you're getting the best together and, and working together and then reaching out. Uh, who you reach out to, I think that was another one of your very difficult questions. And um, If you're looking for uh, China and Asia, then there are problems, especially with China, that was mentioned earlier about that the work has to be done in China. In China. It's even, uh, as far as I, my understanding, it's actually um, worse than that. The work has to be done by the Chinese, so you're, hard, you're uh, um, hostage to fortune there. Uh, so it's not only unless, of course, you get partnerships in China and partnerships in Asia, and that obviously those are the more important part partnerships is all right, nice to get them in America and Europe, but you really need them in the countries that you're uh, focusing on. If it is China and the rest of Southeast Asia and Indonesia, then it's important to look for the centers of excellence there and work with them because that's the only way in certain regulatory aspects of China that you get things through. Thank you, Sean. Um, now I'd like to turn to the domestics. So those people who are leading research programs here within New Zealand. And, and I'm going to ask them essentially the same series of questions. But what I want to know from the local researchers is, one, has there been any sort of standouts in terms of what you've learned, what you've gained in terms of research? And two is, where to from here? What are some of the short, medium and long-term challenges that you see working within high-value nutrition? So Sally, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, David. Um, uh, yes, I mean, I, um, I have to say, coming into the meeting, I was looking forward to uh, coming and having the opportunity to spend some time here. Um, I've, actually, um, I've actually enjoyed it more than I expected. Uh, so thank you very Terrific. much. Terrific. Yes, that's good. That's a good thing. Um, but I think um, one of the reasons I've enjoyed it more than I expected is because um, I, I was sort of sitting thinking a few minutes ago, some of the most important things I think come, kind of come around, around the letter C, so collaboration, collegiality, all of these things. And communication. Uh, communication, <laughs> three C's, C cubed, where we can't forget. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, communication. Um, all of these things, I think, are incredibly important for high-value nutrition. And from my perspective, it has been a wonderful opportunity, as, as Sean just said, to get together with the scientific advisory panel. It has been, has been excellent to have a chance to both hear people present different opinions and also to have time to sit and talk about some of the, the programmes. Um, also equally important and, and a very big thing I think for moving forward is that the scientists have plenty of chance for us all to get together as a wider group um, and share our experiences and move forward from that. Um, some of the things I've really loved, um, I think which are really important for the challenge and which some people perhaps have felt, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> felt a little bit nervous about previously is this, op this, well, the opportunity and the question of risk. Mm -hmm. Several people have, have made the statement that you have to take some scientific risk to move forward. And if we're going to make some big jumps forward and we're going to have the opportunity to move into the translational in a, in a, in a big way, we have to take some risk. And so, that, for me, I think that's, one, that's been one of the biggest words in terms of um, statements that people have made, and, I, and, and I, I agree with that. We have to take some risk, we have to invest, we have to look quite a way forwards, and then work in a collaborative, collegial manner, be good at communication, to, to, to let the challenge succeed and, and, and move on. All right, Monday morning it starts, what are you going to do? Well, uh, I, 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 fr fr Friday there is a strategic discussion Friday's at strategic various discussion. levels. Well, clearly I'll be and and I'll give you Saturday and Sunday off. Only time. only this. Yes, Monday morning we're back. We've got the we've got the doors open. We've got the participants coming in. We've got things going flat out. Um, yeah, I think uh, we spent a lot of time getting ourselves in position. We spent a lot of time getting good teams. I think most of the projects are in a similar position. We're actually. We're over, well over the start line now, we're on and running, and we want to keep momentum going and um, yeah, go, go forward full steam ahead. I think that's what we're doing. Monday morning, I'm going to be there, crack of dawn, full steam aheading, David. <laughs> oh, dawn is about seven o'clock at the moment, so oh, I think okay, you can probably excellent. start right. slightly earlier I'll come to your house for a cup of tea first, and then I'll be on my way, yeah. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll continue down that side because I'm facing this way. That, that would be that would be you, Nicole. But before before getting so, um, I, I, I want to just add one further thing. One of the things that was presented is there are a number of clinical trials starting. Um, we need clinical trials to succeed, and we need subjects. We need recruitment. We need the word of mouth. We need people participating. And I'm I'm looking at a lot of middle age <laughs> potential participants. Uh, they all seem to involve fecal collection in some way, shape or form. Um, and I'm so thrilled that you're willing to give of your time. So on the HVN website, in addition to the presentations, we will also be presenting information about the studies, including the patient or participant information sheets. And we would like your support as the scientific community to contribute both actively as volunteers, but also in terms of contributing to the success of these studies. Nicole, two things, <laughs> learning, and what starts next week? Okay, so um, in terms of learning, um, I think for me, uh, we, we, we have heard to publicity uh, the contestable project, the uh, priority investment, but to me, what those two days brought on is 
the complementarity, complementarity across the project and already some discussion on how a, a project can help another project. So I think that's additionality, that's one of them. It's fancy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Complementarity. <laughs> I'm not sure they probably fifty somewhere. Um, and Monday, I'm clearing my inbox. <laughs> not the action I was looking for, but... Um... <laughs> no, I mean, I can just um, uh, reinforce what Sally has uh, done. We, we just got uh, ethic approval, and that's 14. Uh, Richard is recruiting uh, some... Um, a research associate to help with the recruitment, so for us is moving forward with the recruitment of the comfort uh, call and discussing across the values priority to ensure that the methodology we will be using to, through the values and its cost stream are as harmonized as possible. We look forward to the patient information sheet. We look forward to promoting it. I presume you have to live in the Greater Christchurch area or be willing to com commute to the Greater Christchurch area. So that sort of covers people from what? I'm up for it. <laughs> Monday morning I'll, I'll, I'll pop past. Let me, let, me, let me continue to my left and uh, start ladies first. The floor is yours. What have you learnt and where to from here? So I'd say what I've learnt is in New Zealand we often say we're small, we're at the bottom of the world, it takes a long time for things to get here, there's only so many things we can do based on those limitations. I think we've seen over the last two days just what we can do down here at the bottom of the world. The breadth and the depth of the research being performed by people throughout the country and that we can be bold. We do have the latest technology and we can risk what we need to risk to be ahead of the game for our food and beverage partners. What does Monday mean for me? Monday is a day seven as part of our exploratory study. Uh, the midterm goals for us is to be able to translate what we find from this exploratory study and be able to underpin what this variability is so we can move forward for food trials that will allow us to make those claims. And long term, I think really it's about bringing together the 10 year vision that we have for high value nutrition, enacting these partnerships as we go along the way between industry and science so that it's more than just the one billion dollars it's that partnership that it will take us forward into the future and beyond what we have planned in the current foreseeable future fabulous so let me finish off with the two scientists who are leading platform programs now to present the situation as i understand it slight uncertainty about where the science is going in terms of the, the, the bioactives, the biodiscovery, the clinical mechanisms, the areas in which we can ultimately make the strongest health claim. We know the broader landscape in terms of the priority and investments. You know, metabolic health is a, a very big catch-all, but we don't know within each of these things where it's going to fall out, where the real opportunities lie. So in the intervening period, for you, what are the learnings that you've taken away from this? And over the course of the next six months, what are some of the ways in which you're building your programs to be better suited, better able to seize the challenge of providing the insights that are required to drive this science challenge, firstly, in consumer science, or consumer understanding, and secondly, food science and technology? You, you only need to answer one of those two. Um, in terms, I'm going to say that the, the learning that I've got from um, the last two days. I'm just a, amazed at the breadth of the science and the opportunities for consumers in terms of being able to modify their health and, and control it in some way. And we started off the, the conference talking about disruptors and what disruptors can, can occur. And I can't think as I, I look around the work that we're doing that there is any um, any of those projects that consumers don't actually want and need and will want as soon as they can. And I can't see myself that regulators will ever have a, an ability to control what consumers want or not. And you know, we see that around society as we you know, be, become more global, we can contact each other through Facebook. And I think that there's a, 
whole load of questions about transparency and how you get information and validated information, and it may be something that in the future is beyond a regulation. Um, you know, people take whatever foods and illicit substances they may want to take, and they don't take much care about what the regulators say about that, it seems to me. Um, so I think there is a, a very broad opportunity there um, into the future. I think that um, for me, certainly in the consumer science um, insights area, this conference has come at a very, very good time in terms of it's actually showing us the breadth of what those opportunities are. We can see where some of those things will be very easy for consumers to understand, some are very, uh, maybe not quite so easy, and that will help us greatly as we go forward and plan actually the sort of the data collection side of of our program. So that was a fantastic meeting for me. Same question? Except, 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 except we'll also conclude with you, what are you doing Monday morning, but continue on. <laughs> More interesting. <laughs> I think I've seen um, really good progress being made in all the priority research programs, and, and I see um, integration of the supporting platform, the consumer science and the science of food, uh, being integrated into the health platform. That's what we like to see, that's what we plan to do, and it's happening and it's likely to um, improve as we, as we um, go along. I think the real challenge will be to stay everything on track and stay focused uh, as well. Probably more importantly, stay connected with the industry partners and we still have a long way to go in terms of finding new ways of knowledge transfer to industry as well as uh, translational aspects of uh, nutritional sciences and information into um, consumer products or something that's uh, going to be really useful in the end. So that challenge will remain, but there's probably a bigger challenge. Uh, if you look at, if our focus is going to be high-end, high-value products with specific health claims, you're not competing, we're not competing with any other food company. You know, any simple, relatively less, uh, you know, less sophisticated companies. You're competing with Nestle, you're competing with Danone, you're competing with Abbott. And you have to look what resources they put into those areas. The amount of activity they have in exactly the same space that is clearly uh, indicated by some of the searches we have done so far uh, from the patented uh, searches. So I think to make real progress, you know, we can do all the great science, but it has to be very focused and has to be taking into account the New Zealand comparative advantage, otherwise it's, it is going to be an extremely difficult road to stay ahead of those companies. If you're in a different space, I can see it. If you're selling more uh, manuka honey and, and more kiwi fruit, and that's, that's fine because that's a competitive advantage and then, then we can do that. But if you're competing in really high value, you're competing with Abbott, you have to kind of see what resources you have, what they have, and where we have our niche. What, Monday morning? Mm -hmm. uh, golf at Cape Kidnappers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. So, John, I'm going to ask you a completely different question now. You, you've, heard, you've heard from both the international presenters as well as the, uh, the scientists who have presented so far that, that there's a sense of optimism about the research moving forward. There will be collegiality, there will be communication, there will be um, a number of initiatives that are both um, far-reaching but uh, closer to market. There will be a sense of building teams, initiating complex clinical trials. And I guess, I guess from a management or a strategic perspective, there are two important, uh, two important issues um, that need to be considered. The first is, how do we manage risk? And what's some of the strategies that you think are important in terms of managing scientific risk? Off you go, fabulous scientist. We'll, we'll see you again in three years versus chaining them down to KPIs and quarterly reports that are not reflective of the dynamism, the excitement, the shifting sands of research where we can lose that impetus if we sit focusing on quarterly reports. 
So I thought I'd play golf on Monday morning, David. So. That was not the question. Right, right. And, and I thought I might answer the question that I thought you were going to ask me um, anyway. But I, you know, I thought um, I was I was sort of interested in Sean saying that he was embarrassed by his early work, and, and um, that that sets that there's a naivety that we all have as we go into a new area, and as we learn more in those new areas, then we can get smarter and, and we can do things in a better way. And I think. Patrick said it in a different way. He says that they often have businesses come to them and he tells them that they've been wasting a lot of effort if they could have been focused more clearly. So I, I, I think one of the things we have to do in high value nutrition is, is, be, is get into a collective learning mode. So that there's this rapid learning as we share information across the teams, um, access information that how other people have done so. So um, I, I think those are the things that we can add to high value nutrition. I don't think KPIs um, in any way diminish innovation and excitement, David. I think they just um, put a little bit of performance pressure on and, and um, that's just fine. So um, you know, I, I, I think we have an innovative program and we, we do need to uh, give those programs the time to make some progress, but we need to be alongside them and saying let's not make dumb mistakes, let's learn from each other, let's learn from what others have done. Uh, and try and try and make New Zealand a very um, smart country in this place, and that will just add to the excitement. I think, not diminish from the excitement. Um, does that and answer? <laughs> John, there are, there is smarter and there is smartest, and clearly, high value nutrition needs to be flexible enough to seize and capture opportunities that are the smartest. Really, really, the opportunity to be adaptable. To, um, to move forward in areas that have the greatest scientific and economic sense or economic capability. So John, how do we balance that kind of, that kind of dynamic where we need to invest resources from areas that may be underperforming to areas where there is real potential? Well, I mean, I think we've made a set of choices now and we need to give uh, those decisions time to bear fruit and, and time to, to achieve and time to fail and I think there will be a time when we should look back on that and say were they good choices, do they need adjusting? So I, I think these are quite normal processes of scientific and business review that we should take but we, we shouldn't over worry the research on a monthly or quarterly basis I think is, is the point. We should allow the time frames of research to occur so that we take appropriate um, um, looks, look at that and at the same time as you look at the science you look at the changing business environment, the changing opportunity mark, uh, environment, and decide whether there need to be appropriate changes. But I think knee-jerk reactions is never going to work with science. So you, you need to you know, stick with your investments to a point where you can make better judgments about uh, the future. So um, you know, I don't think it's quite as, as black and white as that. I think that, that you know, we're all in this together, and I think you know, it's, it's not um, it, you know, it's an issue where do we develop a collective New Zealand view of the direction of travel and then we work, we work collectively to achieve that direction of travel and we make appropriate mid-term adjustments when we need to. John, I'm going to make a, a number of concluding remarks and then I'm going to hand over to you and uh, you can wrap up with this wonderful panel and then we have a number of thank yous that, that need to be delivered. But it, it, your comments have very strong resonance to me. I've never been involved in anything that's involved so many people, so many scientists, so many willing participants. And I want to thank everybody here in this room for contributing to the past success and what will be the much greater future success of high value nutrition. There has been times in the development of this National Science Challenge where things have been fought out quite dramatically. There has been strong opinions, there's been things on offer that have not been purchased and similarly things that have been purchased that maybe not were, were not offered the way in which they were offered, if that makes sense. And so these national science challenges, because they are mission-led, will need to make strategic decisions about the way in which it evolves and develops. There will be things that happen that will be sometimes difficult and hard to bear at that point in time for researchers who hang very closely to their ideas and needs and wants. But there is two important things that have come out uh, to me over the course of this conference. One, I see collegiality like I have never seen collegiality at any other point in my 
not so long and not so illustrious career, but certainly over the course of my career. I see people talking in teams, I see people working outside of their institute, I see people engaged in multidisciplinary research where they are recognising the skills and expertise that is on, on offer in the person that they are building this relationship with. The second thing is it's not easy. It's never going to be easy. And the only way we are going to achieve a fraction of the opportunity within high value nutrition is to operate A, strategically, and B, to operate in a way where we are building and growing collectively. Mentorship, support, honesty, career building, foresightedness. Those things and honesty are the things that are very necessary in building a successful science challenge. So I wish everybody all the best scientifically and I for one am extremely excited in the science that I've heard and I hope all of you will come back again next year for the next scientific meeting where you start to hear some of the fruits of the labours of these researchers. Thank you.